Hi everybody, it's John back again with another model in box review. This time I'm looking at something, um, probably one of the oldest moulds I've ever reviewed. Um, today we're looking at the Revell 167th scale F8U1 Crusader. Yeah, 167th scale. This is a scale um, that Revell dabbled with, along with another, with, with several other scales that was anything but 172nd. Um, and you'll see a, a model set on the options list in a minute, and you'll see the, the, kit con, uh, the model set consisted of three completely different scaled metal jets in it. Um, <clears throat> but this kit was probably one of the earliest moulds of the Crusader that you can possibly imagine um, having a bash at. Um, the aircraft actually entered service with the American Navy uh, in 1954, and the kit was released in 1956. Um, this was the initial boxing of the model, the Revell Authentic kit, the Vought F8U1 Crusader, that was later called the F8A Crusader by the US Navy, when all the designation letters and codes and Everything was changed for the USAF, well, for all three services, actually. The, um, the, the service numbers and the designation numbers were all changed to simplify everything. But this kit is actually scaled down in 167th scale, which is a very unusual scale. I've never built a kit in 167th scale, so it will be quite interesting to see. I have actually built this kit before, um, but not this kit. I've built the Esai variant, which was 172nd, and I actually painted it up in French naval markings. Um, if you remember, I did an inbox review on um, the Dassault Supra Tondard, which had all the French naval roundels missing. That's because they went on to the Esai Crusader kit that I built. Um, but this was the first release of the, the Revell Crusader in 167th. It was release date was 1956. In the same year, uh, a couple of months after the uh, original Crusader was released, Revell released a set of models called the Supersonic Jet Fighters, and these consisted of the uh, F8U1 Crusader, the F11A Tiger, and the F104A Starfighter. And interestingly enough, the Crusader was the 167th scale, obviously. The Tiger was in 155th scale, and the Starfighter was in 164th scale. So none of the kits are in the same scale as any of the others, but they would have all been around about the same size. Interestingly enough, about similar length, which, yeah, I always thought, you know... Revell did some weird scales, but I always thought they were sort of hovering around the 172nd uh, scale, but obviously not. Um, that Tiger is a very unusual scale. So that was release date 1956. I think that was a couple of months after the original Crusader was released. And then, in 1960, this kit, Boxing, came out, and the kit was renamed the F8A Crusader. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure which uh, naval unit this kit um, comes from. I'm not quite sure at all. Um, but the original Crusaders started to fly with um, VF, I think it was VF 11 on the Federal Delino Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier. And I'm pretty sure that they embarked on that ship in 1960. And this was the release date for this kit, but the aircraft weren't these colours. They were the colours that you're going to see in a minute in the boxing that I'm doing. Uh, so I'm not sure where these are from, but yeah, we'll get to that as well. The other thing that's interesting about these boxing releases is that the Revell kit portrays a Crusader carrying four missiles. And yes, the aircraft could accommodate four missiles, but more generally and more often than not, they carry just one each side of the fuselage. Um, <clears throat> But of course, the Crusader was one of the last naval uh, aircraft to carry an inbuilt machine gun, as standard, originally designed into the aircraft's airframe. And it was called the last gunfighter. An interesting thing about that. Um, the aircraft was also the United States Navy's first, uh, 
first Mach 2 um, carrier borne fighter, the aircraft could achieve a speed of sound twice with a top speed of 1380 miles an hour. Um, an, an interesting look at the parts there. These parts are exactly the same as the parts that I've got in my kit, only these are grey and in the one in my kit they are white. The kit was released in 1960 and then it went on to 1961, exactly the same boxing but this time instead of being called um, Famous Artists Series, they were called Famous Aircraft Series and the boxing was changed, the parts stayed exactly the same. Um, the picture on the on the box was identical, no change whatsoever, um, and that went through to 1961 through to the early 60s. Then you come to the kit that I'm going to be reviewing, the 1967 release. Um, this kit is actually marked with a free gift stamp inside, and they changed the uh, series collection to Jet Commando range. The F8E designation clearly marked on the box because by 1960, I think it was 1963, all the aircraft in the US inventory were redesignated um, with new numbers and the F8U1 became the F8A, the F8C and then later the F8E. Um, and this is the subject of the kit that I'm doing the review on. 1967 went through to the last boxing of this particular scaled Crusader before they went over to the new kit, which was the 172nd scale, and this was the US Navy's Crusader. Again, exactly the same markings as the kit that I've got. Um, the actual model I think that's viewed there is actually the same model that I've that was on my boxing. It's identical in every way, shape, or form. And I'm going to, when I do the inbox review, you're going to see some pretty interesting stuff that Ravel did in the 50s. And the 60s. So that's basically the uh, the boxing history of the uh, 167th scale Crusader. We'll leave you with a nice image there of uh, one of the aircraft from the actual um, squadron that the model is depicting from VF-11, US Navy, aboard the Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This picture would have been taken around about 1965, I believe, when the aircraft had different tail flashes. But the squadron usually carried this fin flash here, which is depicted on the kit as well. 202 is featured here. The model that um, has mar the, bump, the markings provided are for 211, which I think is an aircraft which um, was eventually scrapped. Quite a few Crusaders crashed actually and were, were lost due to operational uh, environments because the aircraft were quite difficult to get used to. But there was an interesting story uh, where the Crusader performed the only one and has been the only one of this occurrence ever since where because the aircraft's wing had what's called a variable incidence on the wing which made the aircraft um, lift the entirety of the wing above the fuselage on landing and takeoff phases it gave the pilot a really good field of view forward when he was um, taking off and landing especially in the landing phase the problem with it is is the pilot couldn't see the wing at all and there was uh, there was a, an instance in 1962 I believe where one of the F-11's Crusaders took off did a 10 minute sortie and then landed again with the wing still folded and I think the aircraft was actually in the incident raised position for the wing leading edge as well so the aircraft performed a, a, I think it was 12 and a half minutes or something um, before it returned back to base on the aircraft carrier and he had, still had his wings folded and it's the only case of an aircraft that took off with its wings folded that managed to still fly. Virtually every other aircraft where the pilot made that mistake has crashed on takeoff. So that's the, that's the claim to fame for the, uh, the Crusader. I'll just spin this picture around a little tiny bit more so you can see the, see the image there a bit better. There you go. <clears throat> so that's the... Um, that's the Crusader boxing history, and a couple of nice pictures there of the aircraft. I'm just going to pan the camera down onto the table so you can see what I'm actually reviewing today. The box is quite narrow. It's not going to sit right. There we go. I think it is. There we go. It is. It is going to sit right. There we go. The box is quite a narrow box, as you can see. It's quite thin, and the box is actually quite well packed. And this particular box is in pretty poor condition because I bought this kit in a stash 
purchase. Uh, it came with uh, about seven or eight other models that I bought of somebody who just lost interest in modelling anymore, and he was he was getting on in in, in uh, years. But I'll take the box lid off. We'll um, take the parts out. <coughs> Take this stuff out here so you can show you at leisure. <coughs> Take all the parts out. The kit is actually quite detailed when you consider how old the model is and how dated the model is. I'll just keep these transparency parts separate. Can't find the other one, there it is. Right. Now then, first of all, we'll start with the instructions because the instructions are interesting. Remember the first thing that you know about a Ravel kit when you buy a Ravel kit and get the instructions out of the box? They always have a photograph of the model on the front of the box made up so you, you have a pretty good idea what you're going to end up with when you're finished. And in 1956, there was no exception. Um, this particular kit, remember, is a 1967 release, but I think you'll find... The H255 is still the same number, serial number, and the, the plans in this kit are 1956 copyright. And in those days, the plans and quite a lot of the part, uh, quite a lot of the bits and bobs that went into a Revel kit, even though the kit was originated in America, because there was no Revel Germany manufacturing parts in those days. All the kits came from America. A lot of the plans were produced and printed in Great Britain for a Revell by another company um, based in Camborne Road, Potter's Bar, Hertfordshire in England. There it is clearly written there. Now I don't think this company was actually a Revell company holding. I think they were just a printer's company that produced the plans and the plans for all of their early uh, release models and that the instruction leaflet is actually quite interesting because it's a funny shape it's not a4 it's a bit bigger than a4 but it's the same height but it's a bit wider um, and the Revell label there carries the flash of the American flag can you see that although it's not red and white it's black and white um, you have some nice information there um, on the aircraft and also on John Glenn's aircraft which was the airplane that set the world record um, and also uh, information there on one of the aircraft that did the coast-to-coast -coast record breaking flight and they were all Crusaders um, interesting uh, bit of ban interesting bit of gump there and then you come to open the page up and the first thing you notice is is the kit comes in eight stages there's the eighth stage there. There you go, eight stages. And there aren't very many parts in any of the stages. About the most complex, well, the most um, number of parts are probably in stage five, where you have the sub assemblies of the wings to put in and the undercarriage doors and the undercarriage legs to all assemble. But in stage one, <laughs> this is really interesting. At the, top of, at the top of the instruction sheet before stage one, you've got a little instruction guide there, and it says get your tools ready. And in, in the early days of modelling, these companies, companies like um, Frog, Hasegawa, Revell, Hawk, Aurora, and a few other companies, Lindbergh, they all produced plans which um, gave you quite expressive information on how to how to cut parts off and what tools to use and they went to town to show you how to get the best results out of your model and then they also state here it's interesting what they stay here it says first fit parts together and trim excess plastic and then apply cement very sparingly to too much cement will damage your model use a toothpick or pin or a small paintbrush to apply cement if you wish to paint your model, see the painting on page two through to four for colour suggestions. Now, oh, <laughs> I always thought this was a really nice touch in the early days because you don't tend to get an awful lot of that now. You know, the instru instructions just take it for granted that people seem to know what they're doing and how to do things. But of course, it isn't the case when you're attempting to do your first kit. Anyway, section one comprises of two parts the fuselage, 
I wonder if I can get this a little bit further back for you so you get a better view of what's going on here. It's a little bit better. It's probably a little bit better, isn't it? You've got the fuselage and the pilot and pilot seat as an assembly for part one. And the fuselage is part two, right-hand side. Um, the pilot is actually... <laughs> the interior of this kit is probably the most basic you could possibly imagine. There's a massive ring on the back of the pilot seat which is a locating ring that goes on that little pin inside the fuselage. And then you rest his foot on the other locating pin in the front of the fuselage. I would suggest that you probably need to weight this kit because it does sit down tail quite low to the floor with the nose sticking up in the air slightly. So I would put some weight, um, I would suggest you put some weight forward of the pilot. Um, and maybe a little bit of weight behind the seat just to give the nose a little bit of weight to make sure the nose wheel sits on its undercarriage properly. Um, <clears throat> the aircraft sits on its undercarriage properly rather. Section two is to put the nose cone and the tail assembly and jet pipe into place. It's quite interesting that in the instruction leaflet they call part five the tail cap. It's actually an exhaust pipe for the engine um, but I always think it's interesting what, what they call certain parts of the aircraft in the you know in the early days this, this is going back to the 50s remember section three is the wing assembly this kit does not have folding wings but it does have optional position wings which is nice because you know sometimes people want to have them in static display showing what they look like on the carrier deck section four is the undercarriage assembly the undercarriage um it's quite basic on this kit, but the wheels, I do believe, will all rotate, um, which again is something nice. I don't know why, um, but a lot of companies in the 50s and early 60s went to town to try and make the wheels work and the ailerons and you know elevators rotate, uh, operate properly and the, the rudders operate properly. And they seem to go to town um, in a lot of kits, um, and this one has working wheels. Section 5 is the undercarriage doors, wing assembly and the undercarriage application. Um, <clears throat> and again, you've got painting suggestions all the way through this instruction leaflet, which is really nice. And then on section 6, you've got the sidewinder and sidewinder mount application sets there on both sides. And then in section 7, you apply those to the side of the fuselage. And also you fit the canopy and this part here, 26, which is actually the pilot's step for getting into the aircraft. I'll show you the, the, the parts in a minute because the parts are actually, a, there's a nice touch in this kit, which I didn't get with the Esai kit when I built the Esai Crusader, but it's definitely present in this model and it's a very nice touch indeed. Section 8 is decal application. Now this kit isn't so old that it's got the... Uh, decal application emboss marks on the airframe which are a nightmare because in the early really early models when uh, Ravel produced kits companies like Hawk and Lindbergh produced kits that were in silver plastic um, and this kit may be one of these if you get a 1956 edition um, you might find that the the markings are clearly laid out in embossed markings on the airframe and these have to be sanded down because they look atrocious and they actually stop the marking from sitting on the uh, airframe properly. But all the markings on, are on this kit that are required for the version that, um, that I'll be doing, which is one from the, uh, the FDR USS aircraft carrier, uh, which is really nice. Now then, the other thing that I wanted to quickly show you before we go into the decals is the decal application. This is something else that you didn't get, although I did get it with the Bulldog inbox review. The instructions on that, it shows you to put the decals in place before certain parts go in place. And I'm guessing that the rocket rails on this kit should be applied after you've painted the model and put the decals on, because they have to go over the top of that stars and bar marking there. And also, um, there's something else as well. I can't remember what it is. Um, <clears throat> uh, I must be thinking of a different kit that I've looked at recently. Um, <clears throat> there's plenty of plenty of room for putting detail in the cockpit of this kit because the cockpit is enormous on this model 
and there's very little in it, just a pilot and pilot seat. So you could super detail the cockpit up quite nicely, put an instrument panel in, a floor pan, a joystick, uh, side panniers and side avionics and systems like that, which would enhance the kit no end. But I think even you must uh, agree with me that the finished result that this model is portraying here looks quite nice, doesn't it? There are a couple of things which I intend to do, and I'm hoping I can actually do. One of them is to bore the hole out, um, and I'll show you that in a minute of the jet pipe, because the jet pipe is a joke at the moment. Um, just quickly want to show you the, uh, the decals. Bearing in mind this kit was released in 1967, the decals don't look that bad, do they? They've also got the gaps for the stars and bar stripes where they go across the folding wings. So that if you want to have the wings folded, obviously there'd be a gap in the star and bar, and they've actually provided that gap for you, which is really nice. It's a nice touch. Um, there is quite a bit of yellowing going on to the backing film on these markings, which is a shame, but when you think that these markings are 51 years old, they haven't fared that bad, have they? <laughs> uh, quality of the markings? Well, the register is very good. Um, if I bring the markings up close, you can see that all the markings are quite clearly definable. Primus Prinipes? Is that Prince Prinipes or something? Um, you've got IDs there for all the decals, and they're quite clearly uh, labelled. And you can read everything. I'll bring that close to the to the camera, so hopefully you can read that where it says danger. There's an arrow there. So the decals are quite nice, although they are quite thick and heavy set with a bit of yellowing to the backing film, which is a shame. Now then, <clears throat> transparencies. The transparency on this kit is pretty basic. I mean, that's the forward windshield. Um... The frame is virtually non-existent on that windshield, and yet I know there is a frame on the front of that. So I'm going to have to not mask it off, but make sure it goes on correctly. It's quite clear, it's quite crystal clear, it's quite nice. Um, <clears throat> the other transparency part, which is the back of the cockpit hood, again is quite clear. There's a tiny abnormality in it there, which you can see, it's just a tiny blob. But again, you have to remember this is 1956 moulding technology. The canopy isn't great, but I wasn't expecting it to be fantastic. But if you wanted to supplant that with an aftermarket part, you can probably get quite a lot of different aftermarket companies' canopies um, to replace that. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to use that one, I think. I think it will be all right to use that. Now then, <clears throat> I'm not going to show you both the fuselage has, but I do want to show you the one that carries the step for the pilot. <coughs> Sorry about that, right. This is the quality and detail on the fuselage, and it ain't great, is it? I'll be honest with you, the actual raised panel lines, there are, they are raised panel lines, are so finely raised that I don't think you'll ever have to worry about them at all. If you touch that with the sand and paper, it would probably disappear. The lines are very, very faint, um, but they are they are apparent. And I think if you if you wanted to to have the line show up through the paint, you'd have to apply the paint very, very sparingly. Um, maybe build up two very thin layers of of the paint colour. In the front here, you can see very clearly there there is a pilot step in the port side of the fuselage half there, which is really interesting. I've never seen that on a kit ever, an open pilot step. Normally they're just shut because in the real aircraft, that would be a shut flap and the pilot would push his foot through the flap into the ledge. But that is actually open, which is interesting because that would never actually look like that. It would just poke in and he'd be able to put his foot through it um, <clears throat> so that's that's an issue really with the kit. I think, you know, I think I'll be tempted to um, 
although I'll have to have a look at some photos to make sure that they did push in rather than pull out. Um, but I can't see them pulling out. Most aircraft um, steps pushed through with the, with the pilot's foot. The interior of the kit, you can see the interior of the cockpit there is, is pathetic, isn't it? There isn't even an instrument panel there. Um, yeah, that's pretty pathetic. So, and even the gun mount on the front there is, it's nothing to write home about. There's nothing really fantastic about that. So the detail on the kit is pretty poor, I'll be honest with you. It's, there is some detailed panel lines here and there, but there's, what's there is not fantastically apparent. And the kit's detail is pretty, pretty terrible, I'll be honest with you. It's a very basic kit. Um, nose wheel undercarriage oleo there comes in two halves so the wheel will actually sit inside those and you glue them together that part there on the end with the tab on is actually the pilot's first step the one that drops down towards the bottom of the nose wheel and then you've got a stinger arrestor hook the nose cone the two main undercarriage wheels and oleos there on that sprue and i think that's a forward nose wheel door um, the detail on these parts is is okay the detail on the wheels is okay, I suppose. The e-side kit was a lot better in terms of reproducing the parts and making them look correct. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you that in a minute. That's just basically a sprue with all the undercarriage doors and the pilot, which looks something like the uh, astronaut in Aliens, doesn't it? Do you remember when they went in, in Alien, the movie Alien, and they found that guy who was uh, in the seat? And it said, it looks like he's growing out of the chair. Yeah, they might have used him to actually copy. I think Geiger had a go at him, didn't he? He's even got an oxygen mask that looks like it's growing out of his face. <laughs> it would be interesting to pay him up to see if he does look like he's growing out of the chair. That would be interesting. But that's that sprue there. The third sprue covers... Two of the wing halves, one of the tail planes, um, the rocket rails there, and the nose wheel. And also, you've got two um, under fuselage strakes, and the Crusader, I do believe, was the first, certainly the first US naval aircraft to carry under fuselage strakes, but it could have been the first. American aircraft to carry under fuselage strakes and they helped the aeroplane stabilize uh, when you were making final approach and taking off from carrier decks when the aircraft was flying at lower speeds than it would normally fly at a normal flight. The fourth sprue covers the other two wing halves and the tail plane. This is obvious, obviously a stabilator, what they call an all moving surface. No, sorry, that's not the tail plane, that's the tail plane. <clears throat> That's the tail plane, which is a stabilator. That's the tip of the wing. This is the optional position wing tip that um, you can either have in the raised position or the level position for in flight. And then you've got four um, sidewinder missiles there, which look pretty basic as well, don't they? But then sidewinders are pretty basic. And then we come to the part that I wanted to show you most of all. This is the jet pipe, or what they call the tail cap. And the jet pipe on this kit is one of the worst exhaust pipes I've ever seen for anything I've ever built. That is absolutely hideous. And it actually looks like the underside of a frying pan. But what I intend to try and do with this is I intend to try and bore that hole out, which is not going to be easy because the cap is actually solid. Can you see that? So that's going to be quite a serious bore. Um, but I'm going to attempt to bore that hole out. And then I'm going to paint the inside of these recesses matte black and then pick out all of the detail that's showed there in some sort of metallic, maybe a metallic gold colour to try and bring it out to make it look a bit rusty. Um, and just try and pick out the detail, even though the detail is terrible. I think it will enhance it a little bit. But that plug in the middle there needs to come out seriously and really does need to come out the actual crusaders jet pipe itself looks nothing like this this was a i'm sure it was an artist impression because the kit would have been developed during the development stage of the crusader and they probably would not have had an awful lot of opportunity 
to make observations of the aircraft because when this was being developed, this kit, the aircraft was still being developed as well and was absolute frontline high tech, um, top of the tree uh, technology for the US Navy at the time. So I don't think Ravel would have had much of a chance to look at it and get it right, but that is pretty, pretty abysmal. <laughs> I've yeah, I've seen more accurate looking frying pan bottoms than that that look like a jet pipe. So that's the parts, <clears throat> the instructions and decals for the kit. What I quickly want to do now is just go through the usual gumph that I go through. We'll leave you the image of the box so you can see that, and then I'll just quickly go through the uh, information that uh, regards this kit and the other options available. The kit itself is the Ravel Vault F8E Crusader, model number H255, and the release date was 1956. The kit is moulded in 167th scale, and the decals are for a Crusader F8E of F VF-11, based aboard the USS Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1960. The kit comprises of 37 parts on six white plastic sprues and two parts on one clear plastic sprue, making 39 parts in total. I know you only saw four sprues, but the other two sprues were the mounting trees on both of the fuselage halves. There are it would actually render the fuselage halves attached to a sprue, so I've included them as a sprue each, so it makes six sprues in total. Aircraft kit dimensions are 9.5 inches long by 7.5 inches wingspan and 3.5 inches high on its undercarriage. The options and costs are quite interesting because a lot of these kits' options are actually tooled off other companies' kits, but I'm going to explain exactly what they are. Nichimo did the smallest scale Crusader models and they comprised 24 aircrafts in the box and they were all 1 300th scale and they're obviously for uh, wargaming and diorama boys um, but I have never been able to find any idea of the cost of any of the Nichimo kits but they are readily available in America so if any of you guys in America have got any idea how much these kits cost it would be nice to uh, get somebody to pop something onto the comments because I would be quite interested because they look quite good inside the box. I've seen, um, I've not seen the contents of the Crusader kits, but I've seen contents of other kits the US Navy are covered by. Um, the Corsair, I've seen Hornets, I've seen Tomcats, and I've seen a couple of Skyhawk kits and some of the sprues. Um, I've seen photographs of some of the sprues and the kits look re really good for 1 300th scale. And some of the guys have painted them up and they look really, really superb. 144th scale is covered by four companies of which use um, two different companies' moulds. There's a company called ARII, or it might be called RA or RI, and they build the FHC uh, in 144th scale utilising the Otaki mould. And that kit sells usually for about 10 to 20 pound. The Entex offering FHC, again using the Otaki mould, retails for about 15 pound. The Otaki FHC, utilising their own mould, is about 15 to 20 pound. And there's another company called Flats or Platts, P L A T Z, who build the F8K, comprising two kits in one box. And that kit retails for 22 to 30 pound. In one 140th scale, yeah, that's an unusual scale too, isn't it? There's a company called Sanway who produced the F8U1P, which was the earliest um, pre-production prototype uh, before the aircraft went into service as the F8A. And that retails for about £20. There's a one 100th um, scale available from a company called Idea who produced the F8E for £10 to £20. Hobbycraft also produced the F8E from the Idea mould, which is about £35. Ravel produced a 1 100th scale F8E utilising the Takara mould, and that retails about £22 to £45. And the Takara moulding offering for the F8E retails for £25 to £30. Then you have 1 72nd scale. <clears throat> 1 72nd scale is covered by Academy, who produce an F-80 for £7 to £24. 
Ace Hobby Kits produce an F8E, which is actually the Revell mould, and that kit retails for £16 to £22. Pound. Uh, Isai uh, build an F8E, which is £4 to £12. Pound. Hasegawa build an F8E, which is £5 to £15. Pound. Henna produce an F8E, which is uh, £5 to £20. Pound. Hobby Boss produce an F8E, which is £12 to £20. Pound. Italeri, who utilises the Isai mould, retails for, as, I've seen it as cheap as three quid, but it usually retails for between 10 and 15 pound. And there's another company called Kang Nam, who produce an F8E for five to 15 pound. Then you have the Revell offering, F8E, that retails for about 10 to 15 pound. And Testers also produce an F8E utilising the Heller mould, and that kit, I've seen it as cheap as 350 but it usually retails for 10 to 15 pound. The 167th offering from Revell, who build the F8E, um, is 7 to 45 pound, depending on the condition and the age of the boxing. And in 148th, again, you can get quite a few offerings from different companies. Aurora do one, an F8A, which is retailing for between 17 and 70 pound. Uh, Edward build an F8E, utilising the monogram mould, which is 45 pound. Isai produce an F8E, which is six to fifteen pound, and Hasegawa produce the F8E with a monogram moulding, which is thirty-five to sixty pound, depending on the age of the box and the condition. Lindbergh also produce an F8J, which is eight to twenty-five pound. Monogram produce their own mould of an F8E for fifteen to twenty pound, and Revell utilise the monogram mould to produce an F8E, which retails for twelve to twenty pound. And then you've got the piece de la resistance. In one thirty second scale, and I've actually got one of these kits in my stash and can't wait to build it, but I need the room on, and the time, Trumpeter build an F8E and another boxing of the F8J. And that kit usually, usually retails for between 70 and £100. I have seen it on sale for about £150 in America. Um, but I was really lucky because I bought this kit when I was in China once and I think it cost me about 24 quid. So yeah, I was really lucky to get hold of this. It's a beautiful kit. Um, it is a real beauty. It's probably the best uh, the best Crusader model I've, I've ever seen. It's absolutely fantastic. Now then, conclusions. <clears throat> the Revel 167 scale F8E is not the best Crusader kit by a long chalk, but it's the only 167 scale option open. The accuracy doesn't look too bad, but the decals seem, well, to be honest with the decals seem okay too. They're not that bad. The panel detail is very fine and it's raised, but it's hardly visible. And for a 1956 release, the mould, well, I'm thinking the results will probably be the proof in the pudding, but time will tell. I am hoping this kit will actually produce a reasonably accurate early generation Crusader. I like the Crusader. I think it's a really attractive jet naval aircraft. Um, it just looks like a fighter and as I said I have built this kit before the Esai kit is really nice and 72nd scale it's a really nice kit um, but I've also heard that the Heller kit is quite nice as well um, so anyway that's the inbox review finish for this particular kit I hope it's been of some use um, and I hope that all of your future model builds and future projects are running as smooth and I hope you have no problems whatsoever and if you fancy a a Revell uh, sorry if you fancy a Crusader um, and you find one of these going cheap it would be quite an interesting build because as I said it, it's like taking you back in time especially with the instructions and the quality of the plastic and the quality of the actual parts it, it is a blast from the past but I think if you're looking at a kit from 72nd scale I don't think you can go far wrong too much. Um, the Isai kit is quite nice, but I think my favourite would probably be the Academy offering. I think the Academy offering is a cheap and cheerful kit, and it's it's got pretty good reviews. It's quite an accurate little kit. Um, in 48th, I would definitely go for the Edward model. The Edward model looks fantastic. The decals on it look superb, but you have to remember it's still using the monogram moulds. And the monogram kit is an awful lot cheaper to buy than the Edward kit. 
And if you really want to go the whole hog, get yourself a Trumpeter F8 ELJ. It's superb. Anyway, thanks for watching, lads. I'll see you for the next inbox review. Bye for now.